This morning we're going to be reading in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. The scriptures say this, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in a death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin reign, therefore, in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you're not under law, but under grace. Well, this morning we are continuing our sermon series in the book of Romans. And as we do, we come to Romans 6 as Hunter I just read, and as we dig into this passage this morning, I want to make this as, as practical and as personal as I possibly can. And so here's what I want you to envision and, and think about um, as we begin our time together. I want you to think about just the biggest sin struggle, the biggest sin issue in your life right now. Particular sin issue that just seems to maybe even have a grip on you. One that you have tried to fight against, wage war against, battle against, but just seems to keep on creeping up and rearing its, its ugly head. One in which you have confessed, one in which you have prayed against, one that you have sought to battle against, but just seems to, seems to continually just be there. So I want you to think about exactly, I want you to maybe even write that down, but just in, in your mind, just think about what that particular sin struggle, sin issue in your life might be. Now I want you to envision this or imagine this. I want you to imagine texting Paul, like the Apostle Paul, like the, I know he didn't text, okay, but the, the one who wrote Romans, and asking him if you two could meet up sometime so that you could share with him just kind of your sin struggle that you're walking through and get his advice, get his counsel, get his help in regards to helping you to fight against and overcome and have victory in this area of your life. So like that's kind of what this message, this sermon is gonna be. This is like you and Paul in his office at the coffee shop at your place, you sharing with him, hey Paul, struggling with this. Keep on, keep on wrestling with this. Can you help me? I, I can't seem to have victory in this sin issue. You got, any, you got any advice, you got any counsel, you got any words of wisdom that you would share with me to help me to overcome this particular sin issue in my, in my life. And so then as you're sitting across from Paul, what Paul's gonna do for you and what he's gonna do is he's, he's gonna share with you in regards to after you've kind of gone through the struggles, issues, he's gonna share with you then Two truths you're going to need to know, and then three things you're going to need to do. He's going to share with you two things you need to know, and three things you need to do as you seek to wage war, have victory over, and overcome this particular sin issue in your life. And that, that's the way that this passage that, that Hunter just read is, is laid out for us 
this morning. That in, in, the, ver, in the first 10 verses here, we're going to see two truths we need to know as we fight against and, and battle against sin issues, sin areas in our lives. And then in verses 11 through 14, we're going to see three things we need to do in our, ba- in our battle and in our fight against sin in light of these two truths that we need to, that we need to know. So this is you, Paul, sitting down, him counseling you after you've gone through your story of the particular sin issue that you seem to continually wrestle and struggle with. Here's the first truth he's going to tell you that you need to know as you wage war against it. Sit on your hand out there. It's that you've died to sin. That you've, I put this corporately for us as Christians within this church body, that we've died to sin. So then before we, we, before we jump into verse, verse one here, it's important we remember, obviously, the context of this passage and what led, what led up to this passage to begin with. And in order to do that, we need to remember where we left off last week at the very end of chapter five. And so if you remember at the very end of chapter five, specifically there in verse 20, Paul makes this comment. He says that where sin increases, grace abounds all the more. And what he means by that is that we can't out the grace of God. We, we can't out the grace of God. In other words, for those of us who've been justified, for those of, of, of us who've been declared righteous by God because of Jesus' righteousness that has been credited to us and counted to us and imputed to us as being, as being ours, there's nothing that we can do to unjustify ourselves. There's nothing that we can do to reverse God's declaration of righteousness by which he declared us to be. And the reason for that is because God's declaration of righteousness on us, as we talked about last week, isn't dependent upon us and our righteousness. It's dependent upon Jesus and his righteousness, and we're united to him. And so therefore, since he's righteous, God declares us to be be righteous. So then follow this logic and train of thought. If all of that is true, which think we believe it is, but if all of that is true, then the follow-up question would be this. Look at verse 1 of chapter 6. What shall we say then, if, if all of that is true, that just, just describe, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? In other words, do you see the, the question there? If I'm counted righteous, if I'm justified and declared to be righteous by God because of what Jesus has done, and there's nothing that can undo that, if it's dependent upon his righteousness and not mine, then does that mean I can live however I want? Like, does that give me a free license to sin? Like, if if God's going to forgive me and show me grace no matter what I do, even if sin increases, then does that mean I can just increase in my sin and continue to live in my sin? Does that give me a free pass then to just live and do and act however I want to? Well, look at the answer that Paul gives to that question there in verse two. He says this, by no means. In other words, this is really emphatic in the original language, but he's saying absolutely not. Like that, that's crazy, no, no. Like, no, we're not supposed to continue in sin because grace will abound. We're not going to continue in sin because we know we'll be forgiven. We're not, going to con- we're not supposed to continue in sin because we know that, oh, it doesn't matter. God's going to show us grace. Like Paul's saying, that's great. By no means, no. That's not how we're to live. That's not how we're to respond. No. But here's why. Here's why we're not going to continue in sin even though, we're no, we're, even though we know that we'll be forgiven for it. Here's why we're not, cont- we're not to continue in sin, even though we know that God's going to show us grace. Here's why we're not, cont- we're not to continue in sin. Look at the question Paul asked there in verse 2. He gives the answer in this question. He asks, how can we who died to sin still live in it? In other words, do you see his response there, his answer there? 
how can we continue to live in sin if we've died to sin? Like, you can't. It's illogical. If, if you've died to sin, then why would you continue to live in it? And what he's saying here, he's not saying that it's impossible to continue to live in it or it's impossible to stop sinning. That's not the point. He's just showing the moral incongruence that's there. If you died to it, then why on earth would you continue to live in it? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And so then what Paul's going to do in the rest of this passage then is he's going to unpack and begin to explain what he means when he says that we've died to sin. In other words, he's going to explain how we died to sin, when we died to sin, and, and what it means when he says that we've died to sin. And so then we see this starting in verse 3. He's going to begin by explaining how and when we died to sin. And so then look at verse 3 with me. Paul says this. He says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So there's a whole lot of debate when it comes to those three verses there. And the debate really centers around what Paul's talking about here, specifically when he mentions this whole idea of of baptism. And so then there are some who think that Paul's talking about physical water baptism like we do on Sunday mornings in our horse trough. There are others, though, who would say that what Paul's talking about here is spiritual baptism, that, has a, that occurred at, at a point in time which occurred at, at our conversion when we placed our faith in Christ. That at that point in time, in our conversion, when we placed our faith in Christ, then we were spiritually baptized into Christ and united with him, like we talked about last week. We were joined together with him. And since we've been united to Christ, then we're one with him now. And what happens to him then happens to us. And what's true of him then is now true of us. And so then when it comes to this whole idea of of baptism within the context here, I personally believe, and I could be wrong on on, on this, okay, so just putting all that out there, I personally believe that Paul is specifically referring to spiritual baptism within within these verses here. I think he's specifically, within the context here, referring to the spiritual baptism that occurs at our conversion that unites us together with Christ. At the same time, though, that's what water baptism symbolizes. That's what water baptism is a picture of. That water baptism is an outward sign, it's a symbol, it's a picture of this spiritual baptism, this union that Paul is referring to here. That, that when we plunge the person who's being baptized into the water, that's a picture of, of their union with Christ in his death. That's a picture of them being baptized into and united to and joined together with Christ in his death. And then when we raise them up out of the water, it's a picture of, it's a symbol of that represents their being united with, spiritually baptized with and united with and joined together with Christ in his resurrection. And so then water baptism then is a visible picture, visible sign of the spiritual baptism that Paul is talking about here in verses three through five. But I would say my understanding is that those verses are specifically referenced to spiritual baptism. But here's the point here. He's explaining how we as Christians here have died to sin. And you can see this on your hand out there, that we died to sin when we were baptized into and united with Jesus's death. In other words, if, if we've been spiritually baptized, if we've been united together with Christ, then what that means is When Jesus died, this is like super important. When Jesus died, 
you died. Like, hear that. When Jesus died, if you've been baptized into, united together with Christ, then whatever is true about Jesus is true of you. Whatever happened to Jesus happened to you. And so then when Jesus died, that means you died. And that, that's a game changer. And this is the primary point that Paul is just hammering home all throughout the rest of this, this passage it's that those who've been baptized into Christ, spiritually baptized into Christ, united with Christ, joined together with Christ, that when Jesus died, we died. So you might want to circle or underline every time that Paul mentions it within, these, within this, this passage here. So look at verse 4. He says again, We were buried, therefore, with Jesus by baptism into death. Verse 5, he says that we have been united with Jesus in a death like his. Verse 6 he says that our old self was crucified with Jesus. Verse 8, he says we've died with Christ like over and over and over again. He's trying to make a point. He's hammering home the point that we, when we were spiritually baptized into Christ at our conversion, we were united with Christ. And so when Jesus died, we died. So here's the obvious question. What on earth does that mean? What, what does it mean that we've died? Like, how did we die when Jesus died? Well, that's what Paul goes on to explain there in verse 6. Look there with me. He's going to explain what, he, what it means that, that we died when Jesus died. He says there in verse 6, he says, We know that our old self was crucified with him, talking about Jesus, with Jesus, in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. So do you, do you just follow Paul's logic, kind of the flow of thought here? Just follow his logic here, right? He first says that our old self was crucified with Jesus. That our old self was crucified with Jesus, which then begs the question, what in the world is the old self? What, it, what is the old self that Paul is referring to here? Well, he's specifically referring to who we were in Adam before our conversion. Who we were before we became a Christian. Or to use the language again, and I just mentioned this, that, that Paul uses in chapter 5, it's a reference to who we were in Adam when we were united with him before we were united with Jesus. That we were spiritually dead, we were enslaved to sin, we were under the power and the dominion and reign of sin, under the curse of God, the judgment of God, the condemnation of God, sin was our master, reigned over us, dominated our lives, controlled us, and ruled us, and we were under a sentence of death and judgment. That, that's, that's the old self, who you were before your conversion, before you were baptized into Christ and united with Christ. That's why then later in, in verse 6, if you see there, Paul, Paul refers to our old self as, as what? As a, as a body of sin. It's because our old self was a body of sin. We were a slave of, of sin. We we're enslaved to sin and the power of sin and the reign of sin and the rule of sin in our lives. But here's the good part. Paul, though, is saying here, when Jesus died, that when Jesus died, then our old self our, our body of sin that was enslaved to sin and of the power of sin, that it was crucified, like it was put to death. It was killed. It died with Jesus on the cross. And as a result, he says it was that body of sin, it was brought to nothing, meaning it was rendered powerless. It was done away with it. It ceased to exist. It no longer exists. But just continue to follow the logic here, right? The ultimate reason then the ultimate purpose for why our old self, that body of sin, was crucified and brought to nothing? We see the reason for that at the very end of verse 6. Look there with me. He says our old self, and that, that body of sin, was crucified so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Do you, do you see what he's saying here? Do you see the significance of what he's saying? 
He's saying, you see this on your hand out there, that since our old self, this body of sin was crucified, then the result of that, so that you're no longer enslaved to sin. You're free from slavery to sin. You're free from the rule of sin, the reign of sin, the control, the dominion of sin in your life. Like sin's no longer your master. It no longer controls you. It no longer rules over you. It no longer drives your life. Instead, your old sin body, your old self, was placed on that cross, nailed to that cross, and it was slaughtered. It was killed, crucified, dead. It doesn't exist anymore. That's the point he's making here. Now, that doesn't mean, then, that you no longer sin. It doesn't mean, then, that you've died to the presence of sin in your life. Instead, what it means is that you've died to the power of sin in your life the mastery of sin over your life. In other words, sin is no longer your master. It, it's, you're no longer under its reign and rule and control and power anymore. Like before your conversion, you were. You were, you were its slave. It was, its, it, it was your master. It controlled you. It dominated you. It dictated and determined what came out of your lips, what came out of your eye, I guess what goes into your eyes, what, all those things. It, it dictated and determined all those things. You were completely shackled and under the control of, of your master, sin. But no more. Because now you have the ability You've been freed from that, from the enslaver and the bondage to sin, and now you have the ability to resist sin and rebel against sin, and you're no longer under the rule and the power and the dominion of sin in your life. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he was an old preacher back in the day uh, from England, but he describes Romans 6 and what Paul's describing here in this way. He uses the analogy of two fields, two fields. One, one field is, is owned by Satan, and it's everybody who, who works in that field is ruled by Satan, controlled by Satan, under the dominion and the power and the reign of Satan. Satan is the master of those who work and, and live in that field. The other field is, is, is God's, it's Jesus's. God is the master of that field. Those who work in that field are, are live in subordination to and under, and under the reign and rule of God as their God is their master. And so then at conversion, what happens then? Well, in between these two fields then is this giant wall that separates these two fields. And so then at conversion, what happens is that God comes in and he grabs those who, who are in Satan's field and under the reign and the the mastery of Satan and under the power and the dominion of Satan and he plucks them out of that field and he puts them into his, into his field. And so then at that point in time then, they're no longer enslaved to and bondage to under the power of sin as their master, under the dominion and the power of sin as their master. They don't belong to sin anymore in that way. Instead, they've been freed from that and they've put They've been brought underneath the power and the reign and the rule of God now in their, in their lives. At the same time, though, even though we're, we're in God's field now and belong to him, we can still at, time, at times hear sin's voice over the top of that wall calling out for us seeking to entice us, reminding us of the pleasures that we once enjoyed as we lived under the reign and the rule and the mastery of sin. 
in that field. And because of that, it can cause us to begin to revert back to old habits and old behaviors and old pleasures and cause us to be enticed to those sorts of temptations and sin in our lives. The difference, though, is that now, since we're in this field, we don't have to listen to the one, to the master in the other field because we're no longer his slave. We no longer do his bidding. And so then, yes, we hear him. At times, we're enticed by him, but we're not controlled by him and enslaved to him any longer. And what Paul's saying here is that if you were at a coffee shop or in his office and you were describing that sin that you're struggling with right now, the first truth that he would remind you of is that you've died to that sin. You're no longer under power and the power and the dominion and the, the authority of that sin. The second truth then that he would want to remind us of is this, and you see this on your head out there, is that we've been raised to new life. We've been raised to new life. In other words, just put this together. We just haven't died to sin. And so like now, now, now our old self is dead and that's it. And so we've been raised to new life. We've been given to new life. It's not just that our old self is dead and that's it. We've been given a new life. And that's what Paul goes on to say there in verse eight. Look there with me. He says, now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So what Paul's doing here, he's making two important truths here. When it comes to the effect that Jesus' resurrection has had on our lives as Christians. The effect that Jesus' resurrection has had on our lives as Christians. And first he says, he says this, he says that since Jesus was raised to life, and so since we're united with him, we, we will be raised to life in the future. In other words, since Jesus has been raised to life and, and, and we're united with him, then that means that we're going to be raised to life in the future, like physically speaking. So that's what Paul's getting at there in verses 8 through 10 in the verses that I just read. He, he's saying there that when Jesus rose from the dead, then Jesus triumphed over death. He, Jesus defeated death. And because of that, then death doesn't have any, a rain, any reign anymore. Death doesn't have dominion over Jesus anymore. And since that's true, what that means is that Jesus isn't ever going to die. But the point Paul's making is, is that that's true for everybody who's been united with Jesus. If Jesus has triumphed over death and therefore is never going to die again, then that's true of everybody who's been united with Jesus. Because whatever's happened to Jesus has happened to those who've been united with Jesus. And so what that means then is that because of Jesus' resurrection, one of the effects of Jesus' resurrection on those who've been united with him is that one day we will be raised physically in the future to defeat death once and for all, just like Jesus did, because we're united with him. But that's not the only effect. Now, I would say that's not the major effect that, that Paul's trying to, trying to hone in on and, and highlight here. He's not only are we going to be raised to life in the future physically. But secondly, he wants us to see here that we've been, to ra we've been raised to life right now in the present spiritually. And this is the main point that Paul wants to highlight when it comes to the effect of, of, of us being united with Christ. And this is what we see in verses four and then also in verse five. Look there again with me in verses four and five. Paul, Paul's writing here in verses four and five about what's happened since we've been baptized into Christ and united with Christ. We not only died with Christ, but he, in verses four and five, he also wants to see that, we're also gonna be, that we've also been raised with Christ. Look at verse four. He says, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like 
his. Just put all that together, right? United with Christ. Since Jesus died, we died. Our old self, our body of sin has been crucified. It no longer exists. But that's not all. Also, since we've been united with Christ, since Jesus rose back to life, guess what? You rose back to life as well. You just didn't, your old self wasn't just crucified. You were given a brand new life. You were raised to a new life. Not, not physically, but spiritually. I mean, our, again, our old self, it, it died and was brought to nothing. And he raised us to a new life. He gave us a new, a new life. But this new life, just put all this together, it's not controlled by sin. It's not under the dominion and power and the authority of sin, the master of sin anymore. Instead, this new life is, is alive to God. It's under the power and the rule and the reign of God so that we can love and serve and obey and, and worship and live in submission to God. Charles Spurgeon, he once gave a sermon. And in that sermon, he gives this story about St. Augustine. And if you know anything about Augustine, Augustine lived a really sexually promiscuous life before his conversion. And so then Spurgeon tells this story of how one day, Augustine was walking down the street, and Augustine sees one of his former mistresses on the street. And this mistress recognizes Augustine and begins to call out to Augustine, Augustine, Augustine. And when Augustine hears the voice of his former mistress, he just turns the other way and walks the other way and puts his head down. And so she runs after him and runs up to him and grabs him and says, Augustine, Augustine, it is I. To which he replied, yes, but it is not I. In other words, the old Augustine, that that mistress knew, and that that mistress had slept with, and that mistress had committed sin after sin after sin with, that, that old Augustine was dead. That old Augustine was crucified and died with Christ. And the new Augustine raised to life spiritually with Christ and has been given a new life. And that, that's the point. Like, that's the point. You sit across from Paul. You say, Paul, guess what? I'm struggling. I, I'm, I'm struggling. I got a sin, I got sin issue of, of pride. I struggle with the sin of jealousy. Paul, I struggle with the sin of just a lack of self-control. I struggle with the sin of, of lust. Paul, I struggle with the sin of, of the approval of people and others. Paul, I struggle with the sin of just fill in the blank for you. Paul would look at you straight in the eyes if you're, if you're a follower of Christ and a Christian, and he would tell you, you've died to sin, and you've been raised to walk in a new life. Which sin leads, those would be the true truths Paul would want you to know. Which sin leads to these three things we need to do. So if that's true, if those are the truths we need to know, the realities we need to know, then what do we need to do? How do we need to respond? Well, that's what Paul begins to explain starting in verse 11 through verse 14. And the first thing he's going to tell us to do, in light of these two truths we, we know, first thing we need to do is this. See these on your handout. We need to consider these truths, right? The truths we just looked at, that we've died to sin, been made alive to God. We need to consider these truths to be true for you. That's, that's, that's what we need to do. First thing you need to do is to consider these truths to be true. To consider these truths we just looked at to be true. That's what Paul goes on to say in verse 11. Look there with me. He says, for you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. What's interesting here is that in verse 11, we have the first command, the first imperative in the entire book of Romans. Like we've gone five and a half chapters with just a bunch of indicatives. No imperatives, no commands. Paul hadn't told us to do jack squat up to this point, right? Nothing. 
Instead, we, then we, we get to verse 11 of chapter 6, and then Paul finally, for the first time in the entire letter, tells us to do something. And you know what he tells us to do? He tells us to consider something. He, he tells us to consider to consider something, to consider the truth of something. And that word consider there, it doesn't mean just contemplate. It doesn't mean just think about. That word consider means to count or to reckon something as being true. It means to count and reckon something to, to be the case. So, so then just put all that together, right? Throughout this passage in particular, What's he been telling us? He's been explaining how we've died to sin, the power of sin, the dominion of sin, and how we've been made alive to God. We've been given a new life in God. We've been raised to a new life in, in God. And now in verse 11, the first imperative, the first command in the entire book, he says, count those truths to be true of yourselves. Reckon this to be true of you. You see what he's saying? He's saying, don't just, don't just think these truths are theological, tr theologically true. We're not supposed to just know these truths theologically. Instead, what he's saying is that we're supposed to apply them personally to our lives. We're supposed to apply them personally to our lives. We're not just supposed to know them theologically. We're supposed to be able to apply them personally to our lives. We're supposed to consider these theological truths to be true for us, to be the case for us in, in our lives. And so, so get really practical. Think about that sin that I asked you to write down or, or think about in your mind. And, and think about like the next time that, that temptation to do and to act in, in whatever way that sin is, it's really strong, and you feel just gripped by it and captivated by it, and you feel like it's inevitable, like, I'm too far into this. I, 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 I can't say no. I'm too far. It's got a grip on me, a hold on me. I, I, I got to just say yes. I got to give in to it. I'm powerless. In that moment, in that moment, when it feels like you don't have a choice, and you just got to act on it. And it feels like you just have to obey that passion and do it and give in to it because you're just enslaved to it. In that moment, what do you do? You consider, you reckon, you count yourself to be dead to the authority and the power and the dominion of that sin and alive to God and that you've been given a new life. That you're supposed to consider that those truths that, oh, I heard John preach on on Sunday morning, those aren't just theologically true. They're applications you're to count to be true for you. And as a result, then, you, you, you remind yourself that I'm dead to lust. I'm dead to the power of greed. I'm dead to the power of just fill in the blank of the sin for you. You don't have to do it. Count yourself. Reckon those truths to be true for you. But that's not all. Secondly, here's what we're to do. You see this on your hand out? We're to act like who who we are. We're to act like who we are. Now, I know that sounds like kind of odd, but this is what Paul's saying there in verse 12. Look there with me. He says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. In other words, do you follow the logic here? Paul's basically saying here, be who you are. Act like who you are. In other words, if you're dead to the reign and rule and the power of sin in your life, and therefore if it no longer has reign and power and control over you, 
Like if that's true theologically and positionally because of your union with Christ, then don't let sin reign and rule in your life. Or if it's true that you've been objectively and positionally set free from sin as your master, then don't obey its passions. Why? Because that's not who you are. Like this is a huge mind shift when it comes to fighting sin. This is a huge like just change of perspective and, and focus when it, comes to, when it comes to fighting sin. If you want any chance of resisting and fighting against sin in your life, that when you're fighting against sin, you have to realize that, that you're not fighting sin in order to become something you're not. Instead, you're fighting sin in order to become the reality of who you are. You're fighting sin to become the reality of who you already are in Christ. And so then the reason we aren't to let sin reign in our lives and the reason we're not to obey its passions is because that's not who you are anymore if you've been united with Christ. So then the next time you're tempted with that specific sin issue, whatever that might be, that I asked you about, then here's what you need to remind yourself of. When that urge is strong and that temptation seems inevitable, you need to remind yourself that's not who you are. You don't belong to that anymore. That doesn't own you anymore. That's not your master anymore. You're not enslaved to that anymore. You don't serve that. You don't obey that anymore. You have a new master, a new a new master that, that reigns and rules over you. Third and final way I need to respond to these truths is this, is that we need to present, you need to present yourself to God, not sin. Present yourself to God, not sin. It's Paul's final point there in verse 13. Look there with me. Paul says this. He says, do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. There's a lot we could get into here, but here's the picture that Paul's painting here. He's painting the picture of a slave-master relationship. And the picture that he's painting here is of a slave offering himself, giving himself, presenting himself as an instrument. The word instrument, instrument means tool. That this slave is giving himself to a, to a master, to his master, as a tool, as an instrument, to be at the disposal of his master, to use however the master wants to use him for his master's purposes. So then this slave is saying, I'm yours, putting myself at your disposal. I'm your tool. I'm your instrument. Use me for your purposes, however you see fit. I don't belong to me. I belong to you. So with that picture in mind then, Paul then is urging us and urging the Roman Christians here. He, he's saying, don't present yourself and offer yourself as a slave to your master's sin. Why? Because we're no longer under the power and the reign of sin anymore. Like sin's no longer our master anymore. So why in the world would we offer ourselves as a slave instrument, as a slave tool to something or someone that's not our master? That's like, doesn't make sense. And that's the point. It doesn't make sense. Sin doesn't make sense. Instead, we're to offer ourselves as a tool or as an instrument to God. Why? Because he's our master now. He's the one who rules and reigns over us now. And because of that then, let's get really practical, right? The next time that sin is just, just calling out and enticing you, and, and, and we need to remember, 
Again, that, that's not your master. It doesn't rule over you. Lust doesn't rule over you. Greed doesn't rule over you. Pride doesn't rule over you. The approval of others doesn't rule over you and control you and have power over you. You're not enslaved to that anymore. You're a slave of God. You're a servant of God. He's the one who rules over you. He's the one that you belong to. And because of that, you present yourself, you offer yourself to him. God, here are my eyes. God, here are my ears. God, here are my lips. God, here is my heart. God, here are my hands. God, here are my feet. Use them as an instrument for the sake of righteousness as opposed to giving the parts of your body over to your your old former sin master to use for his purposes of unrighteousness. In the midst of those temptations, you remind yourself of who your master is now and who you now belong to. Here's the main point. If you've slept through all that and are just now waking up, here's the main point. You're sitting with Paul at the coffee shop in his office. You're talking through your sin issue. Here's the point. Here's the main point he wants to get across. I know we, I've been using words like fight and battle and waging war a lot to describe our, our struggle against sin. But, but here's the main point. If you were meeting with Paul, that, that Paul would want us to know when it comes to our struggle against sin. He would want us to know this. He would want us to know that because we're united to Christ, that yeah, it's it's good, it's right to use that language, fight against sin, battle against sin, wage war against sin. But Paul would want us to know that if we're united with Christ, that the victory has already been won. That the victory has already been won against sin. Because if you're united with Christ, then the reign of sin over your life, it's been toppled, like it's been overthrown, it's been defeated. And and it's in this way then, because of that then, and this is really important, because of that then, we don't fight sin in order to win. Instead, we fight sin because we've already won. Or another way to put it is this, we don't fight for victory. Instead, we fight from victory. We fight because that's not who we are. We fight because we have a new master. We fight because we have a new life. We fight because the old self is dead. We fight because the body of sin has been put to death. We fight because that's not who we are anymore. We don't don't live under the reign and the power of sin anymore. We've been set free from the reign and the power of sin. We're not enslaved to it anymore. And so because of that, at the very end of your meeting with Paul, what he would simply say to you is this. Christian, you're dead to the power and the control of sin in your life. You've been made alive to God and given a new life. So then now, all you're to do do now is to go and live like all that's true. It's that simple. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for your word. And even in coming to a passage like this, I know that all sorts of different sins are represented in this room by everyone sitting in a chair this morning and by the one standing behind the pulpit this morning. And God, I just pray that we would come to realize the significance of these truths that we've seen this morning, that we would see and recognize and count and consider and reckon 
these truths to be true for us as those who've been united with Christ. And I pray that the reality of who we are now in Christ would radically transform how we approach temptation, how we respond to sin, and how we respond particularly in those times when sin just seems and feels inevitable and too much and like we have to do it. God, I pray that in those times that you would remind us of who we are in Christ and who we belong to now and of what's not true anymore. And that every lie that we begin to believe and every lie that we begin to buy into that tells us otherwise, that we would see it as a lie. And we would fight them with the truths that have been secured for us in Christ. And that we would live as free men in service to a new master with a new life. And we pray all this in Jesus' name.